you need to be compassionate towards the horses and you need to, you know, you need to realize that they're not, um, you know, these aren't dirt bikes. They're not, they, you know, they're, they're partners of yours. They have emotions. They need to, um, and you know, you need to meet them halfway sometimes. I think that you need to take a step back a lot of the time and say, you know, okay, A, is this safe what we're putting our horses through? Um, and, you know, but also remember the fact that what we're asking them to do is a bit unnatural. And so if you have some days that, you know, I think A, you need to meet them in the middle with it a little bit, but also be able to say, all right, we need to, um, you know, we need to approach this in a different way. We need to, you know, that you, you can't let your frustration get ahead of you with the horse. Welcome to Practical Horseman's Podcast, a show featuring conversations with respected riders, industry leaders, and horse care experts. The show, which runs every other week, is co-hosted by Practical Horseman editors, and our goal is to inform, educate, and inspire. I'm Jocelyn Pierce, and this week's episode is with international show jumper Andrew Wells. Originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Andrew developed his passion for horses at a young age. He grew up in the sport and eventually trained under equitation and show jumping trainer Missy Clark and finished his junior career with her North Run crew. Andrew took a year off before he started college to train with Olympic gold medalist Chris Kapler, whom he worked with for four years before starting his own training and teaching business in 2010. Andrew made his first Nations Cup appearances in 2009, representing the U.S. in Austria and Portugal. He also represented the U.S. at the 2018 Spruce Medals Mastered CSIO 5 Star and the 2019 FEI Jumping Nations Cup Canada held in Langley, British Columbia. Most recently, Andrew finished the 2019-2020 North American League season by qualifying for April's 2020 World Cup Final, which has since unfortunately been canceled due to the coronavirus pandemic. Andrew Stable, called Team Wells, is a jumper-focused boutique operation based in Wellington, Florida, and now also in Matawa, Illinois, which is on the north side of Chicago. I caught up with Andrew at his base in Wellington at the beginning of January after finishing a photo shoot for his training article in our spring issue entitled Control the Canner for Better Courses. During our conversation, Andrew shared his overall training philosophy, why he believes there's too much emphasis on seeing a distance, what makes him a strong competitor, and more. Now let's jump right into the episode as Andrew shares how he first became involved with riding. I was in second grade, and uh, my parents both rode and were involved in, you know, within the sport. But it was not, you know, it wasn't something I was around every day. And uh, I actually had a friend on the soccer, my soccer team I played on, that took riding lessons. It was kind of you go to school and then soccer, and then he would go to riding lessons. And just situationally, a few times I actually I got a ride home from his mother and but we'd have to stop while he had his riding lesson on the way home and mm. <laughs> after a couple of times I was like I, I want to do this so anyways I took a riding lesson with him he probably stopped six months later and here I am today <laughs> yeah. so you rode from second grade and then you was it when you were 15 you came down and started competing at WAF how did yeah. that transi- transition kind of take place well, yeah, you know, from Minnesota, you know, this is, I, I, don't, I, I don't feel too old, but I'm, you know, I'm older than a lot of the social media and internet that's out there right now, and uh, when I was growing up, at least. And, you know, so there wasn't a lot of, you know, knowledge as to what's mm-hmm. out there in the sport, you know, besides, like, the Chronicle of the Horse that would kind of show up, you know, I'd be eager to read that, but kind of rode, you know, the, the summer horse show circuit that they had in, uh, at, at the MHJ, which there's, you know, fantastic horse shows there in Minnesota and, you know, throughout Zone 6 to Mason City. But, um, you know, it was really just kind of like a seasonal thing in the summer for me. And, you know, I played other sports um, and, you know, it was kind of, it was a, I, it was a partial focus of mine and worked with my um, trainer that I rode with in Minnesota and uh, we came down to Wellington that next winter. And I think from that point on, I was just, you know, all in on it. Mm-hmm. So is that, is that when you started training with Missy Clark? Yeah, it was kind of a bit of an evolution. So uh, my trainer from Minnesota, a woman named Kim Barone, and uh, she, you know, really brought me up such a long way. And uh, she uh, rode with Alex Jane, a little, you know, he helped her, not rode with them, but he helped her 
a little bit with her Grand Prix horse, and his kids rode with Missy Clark, Charlie, and uh, Haley and Maggie. And so, you know, kind of through that collaboration with them, um, ended up doing a little bit of a partnership between Kim and Missy helping me out there. And um, that, you know, as I got further into the, into the sport there, I actually I went to Europe with Missy that summer to mm -hmm. compete. So I kind of went from zero to 60 yeah. pretty quickly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, finished out my junior career riding with Missy and John and the North Run crew, which was, mm -hmm. you know, they're incredible trainers, but uh, on top of that, you know, our generation, we had so many um, up and coming professionals, not that we all knew it at the time, I guess, you know, I'm sure we were all ambitious for it, but we had a really, you know, I think there's 10 of us that rode with Missy and John at the same time that are professionals now, which is, you know, so looking back on those years, and I was actually quite behind them, you know, just because they may have been doing it at this level for a little bit longer, but it was really neat. Yeah. And then um, did you at that, you know, when you were working with Missy, did you eventually kind of decide, hey, I want to focus on jumpers? And how did you kind of make that transition? Yeah, it was um, Chris. He was, you know, on the really on the heels of the, you know, the Olympics in Athens at the mm -hmm. time. Um, had, you know, a, you know, a great string of horses for himself. And he was always somebody that I really looked up to in the sport. And, you know, admired, you know, their entire program there. And, you know, and it's the whole Hunterdon training system, um, I think, is the, you know, the bedrock of so many professionals and, you know, top riders that have, you know, for the last, you know, 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. So um, at the, you know, at, at once I finished my junior year uh, or my junior career, I took a year off before I started college mm -hmm. and, you know, went to, Hunter in with Chris and really just, you know, tried to immerse myself in this as um, best I could. And uh, I ended up staying there for four years until I went and started my own operation. And what did you study at school? I mean, you're kind of thinking yeah. about riding, but at the same time, you thought obviously getting an education was important. Honestly, political science. Okay. Um, <laughs> not exactly related to this. You know, uh, I, it was always very interesting to me. To be honest, with you, actually, the world politics side of it, I thought was really quite fascinating. And I, I, I honestly, the I, way I, okay, I can come up with my own tie to the riding world. But what was interesting for me uh, was also, you know, this is such an international community that we ride in. Even though you're, okay, you're in Wellington, it feels like this bubble here. Mm -hmm. But you know, our our social group can be, you know, it's filled. You could have a dinner you with twenty people, and you could have ten different nationalities there. Mm -hmm. And so the international politics side of it, I thought, you know, it was, it was, that was so interesting for me. And I could also relate it to, you know, peers that I knew. And yeah, so it was something I at least liked to, you know, it, my mind, I was usually drawing courses or doodling that mm -hmm. way. Like yeah, would, that was my form of doodling, but at least was interesting enough. I was excited to be there. And then you started your own um, business and mm -hmm. is it in 2010 that you yes, in launched that? And um, with your wife, Alexandra, who also rides. Mm -hmm. um, can you just talk a little bit about kind of what aspects of the business play to your strengths and to her strengths and just about your partnership, I guess? Yeah, so um, we, so I, I, I went off, I started my own business in 2010 and it was actually kind of the same year that Alex and I started dating. And then I would say actually within two years, Alex was really, you know, she was kind of, I guess they moved in, you could say, with me, and we had, you know, kind of our lives blended together around the horses there. Um, you know, our, I, you know, it's a really jumper-focused operation. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had we've had students that, and horses or horses that we've invested in that have been equitation horses and gone on to do great things or, ni you know, some nice hunters as well. Um, but, you know, we're, I would say it's a boutique operation that really focuses on the jumpers, and, you know, I think that you know, from a training aspect, you know, I, I really like to have one-on-one -on -one time with the horse and one-on-one -on -one -on -one time with the rider that we're working with. Um, you know, which, and, you know, so I think from that standpoint, having a really large number doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't go well, you know, when you're having kind of just mass quantities. And I feel like, you know, you just kind of come up with prescriptions, not medication-wise, but, you know, you end up just coming up with prescriptions of courses and, you know, what you do in terms of your work with the horses there versus really being able to dial it in in a horse and rider-specific mm -hmm. way. But Alex is, you know, so she rides as an amateur, I ride as a professional, but she helps me, you know, so much with the day-to-day -day operations of the business there. And she is, 
uh, you know, for me, she's an amazing ground person, actually. And switching gears a little bit, um, I know you talked about a little bit about your teaching philosophy, philosophy about who you, how you really tried to individualize your training mm -hmm. program, but could you talk a little bit about like your overall training philosophy with the horses? Yeah, I mean, so I think the, you know, the bedrock of what this comes down to is, you know, we want to get the, you know, these are, the horses are athletes and we need to treat them that way. And, you know, from that, you know, so I think everything that we work on, we need to keep that mindset there. You know, their, their bodies, I think, you know, there's only so many jumps the horse can jump there. You know, we're asking them to do something a little bit unnatural in itself. You know, I mean, I don't think that, you know, they were necessarily intended to jump over meter 60 fences there. And, you know, they do it really well, and a lot of the, you know, the horses really enjoy doing it there. But I think we always need to have that in the back of our mind. And uh, so for me, I'd say that fitness is the kind of the core principle there. And, you know, the horses have to be fit. They have to be strong without overdoing it. You know, it needs to be intelligent fitness. I think it's, you know, I try to relate how I feel after I go to the gym to how they would feel there, you know, and I think because it's easy sometimes to get running down a rabbit hole. You're trying to train something, thing that things aren't working out, and you know, even for me as a professional, you know, I have you know my um, assistant Eric and Alex and my you know Mario, my you know kind of my he he's in charge of my horses in the barn there, you know. And sometimes there's a you know there's a collaboration between all of us, and they can say you know what I just think that they're not quite getting it today, and you know you need to have checks and balances within the mm -hmm. barn. Um, and, you know, know when, you know, as a team, how, you know, what the right amount of work is there and the timing of that work for their fitness program. Um, but then, you know, so on, and then on top of the fitness, then, you know, we talk about the rideability and, you know, what we've talked about here is, you know, how to create the a good canter on the horse and the correct impulsion. Um, but I think the two kind of go hand in hand because in order for a horse to carry themselves correctly, they need to be strong, but they need to be strong with the right muscles. You know, they can't just, you know, you can't just work them and expect that they're going to be strong to do, so, you know, a totally different kind of work there. You know, if you go out and just say, okay, well, I'm going to ride them for 20 or 20 minutes or 30 minutes and do X amount of trot, X amount of canter, you can't, you can't expect that that's going to get the horses fit for what they need to do. They need to be strong to be able to, you know, to canter correctly so that they develop their muscles correctly to hold the canter the way you want them to, to be able to rock back and jump the way that you want them to. And um, so I'd say that, you know, that's kind of the core, you know, the, I think it, fitness and then the ride ability and the ability for the horse to carry themselves in the canter. But I think that, you know, the two are really tied together yeah. there. Um, and you mentioned this just now, but we, we just worked on a training story for the magazine um, about impulsion and finding a good canter rhythm. And um, one of the exercises that you describe in the story is a figure eight exercise on mm -hmm. the flat. Can you just walk me through that a little bit? Yeah. So it's it, very simple, but I'd say it's kind of the bedrock of my flat work I do with the horses is, you know, the, so the, the main principle that we're working on is always to, you know, that we want the horse to be able to come forward through a turn and then be able to sit on their hind end to um, create a, essentially like a spring platform to jump, uh, jump in front of them. And, you know, I think a lot of times riders go too slow and then they try and, you know, they, they'll chase the horse, you know, they'll ride forward to a fence to think that speed's going to get them across it there or, you know, you know, across the jump or, you know, up and over it, however you want to say it there. And a lot, what that will lead to is a flat jump and it will, you know, the horses, their arc is, you know, going to jump into the fence then. So for me, something that's really important is that you come forward through the turn and that you, in an ideal world, you'd love to have your last two strides be slightly shorter um, to the fence so that you're, the horse is, compressing themselves so that then they have the ability to rock back on their hind end. You create a platform for them to jump off of that way instead of getting their last two strides a little bit longer that they're strung out that way. So the figure eight for me is something that you're, you know, you're really working on coming off of the turn correctly. So you come forward through the turn and I think it's important to come forward off the turn. And then as you go across the diagonal, you can, you collect the horse and uh, you know, you can do it in all three gates. I mean, you can do it at the walk as well. You know, for me, I'll do it at the trot. It could be posting, and then it could go down to sitting. Um, at the canter, 
you know, come forward and then collect. Um, oftentimes I'll halt the horse and back them up. And the whole idea of that is that you're coming forward through a turn and that you're going to collect the horse and have them sit on their hind end. And sometimes that might just be a downward transition. It might be just collecting the gate that you're in. Um, you know, at the canter, I say a lead change is kind of like their, that's their, that's their reward at the end. You know, if they're, I'm either going to come down to the walk, sometimes I'll back them up a step. Um, sometimes I'll hold the counter canter that they really have to be sitting on their hind end, that their front end is free and loose to follow your eyes around the turn. Uh, but I think that when you start to um, jump fences, then you're, you know, you, you're coming off the turn and you want to come forward and then be able to compress the horse. It's really, you know, the figure eight kind of essentially sets up that exercise mm -hmm. for you. And you've also kind of talked about how um, a lot of mistakes you see is riders kind of focusing so much on trying to see their distance or find the distance. Mm -hmm. And can you just talk a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah. So. I mean, distances, we can't go down to fences on a complete miss. And, you know, we need, you know, distances are very important. But I think, uh, and I, I can say this because I struggle with it myself. Um, and this is, uh, I, I think it's a little bit of a flaw in our, the American system that because of the hunters, we become so focused on distances from an early age. And it's, to ride the hunter's equitation correctly, you actually, you know, it's the same principles that I would want to teach there. But I think that we start to look for distances a lot earlier than we should necessarily. And, you know, so if you're, you know, if you're looking for your distance like before you've even turned to the fence there, it's very likely you're going to end up altering your canter as you're going through the turn to try and meet a certain takeoff point on the ground. And there's a lot of variables as you come through the turn. The horse might fall behind you. They might drift out to one side. And so all of a sudden, you've kind of married yourself to a certain distance there and you've let the canter go out the window just to get to that spot. And so for me, I think if you watch the best riders in the world, they are, you know, they really focus on having a good canter and you see very small adjustments from them, but the distances all actually look like they're finding, they're finding perfect distances to the fences there. And I think, you know, if you have a proper canter and you come through the turn, the horse on its own will size up the fence, and oftentimes that the horse will help you know, show you the distance there. And it might be that you have to step forward to it a little bit, or it might mean that you have to uh, collect and compress the horse a little bit. But if you can keep the, I, I call it a pendulum a lot, if you can keep that pendulum in a small swing there, there's just small adjustments there, you're going to keep a more consistent canter throughout the course, and the horse is going to be able to you know, help you gauge the fence instead of you trying to do all the work for them. You know, if you come, if you're constantly changing the canter, the horse, you know, even though they might see the fence, they're not, they're not looking for a distance of their own because they're, you know, they're feeling you making the changes already. And um, that actually sometimes becomes harder when the horse, when the horse is not rising up or showing you the spot, um, you know, you're kind of, you know, and I find this a lot of times with riders that aren't quite as experienced that they'll be trying to force their eye to find something and they'll make changes along the way there and you know the horse is so not going to be able to help them there because they're just working off of their riders aids instead of working off of the fence themselves um and then when it comes into you know in competition there is i think you know if you have when you start changing your canner just to find the distances there you know you might get away with it for one fence two fences but if you all of a sudden you know, start kind of chasing the canter to find a forward distance and then you need to, you have to reorganize your canter and then you, it's so easy to kind of over collect the horse and then all of a sudden you're too slow so you're having to go too fast. So the rounds become quite erratic that way. And, uh, you know, different versions for different riders there. But I think if you can really think about focusing on the canter throughout your whole course and letting the jumps show themselves to you a couple of strides away, which it's hard to trust that they're going to do that. It's, I guess I say it's the hardest thing in the world to trust that they're going to do that. But you know, I promise they will. You know, if you, especially if you give it time and let your, you know, you and your horse um, get to that, you know, get to that um, understanding with each other. And it becomes more of a partnership that yes. way because you're both you're both doing your job instead of the rider dictating everything to the horse. Yep, exactly. Um, so. When you're competing, do you have any kind of a routine before a competition? Um, I try to. You know, I think 
well, you have to be a bit adaptable on this because you know it, there's some days you know that you're com you know for me as a professional there's some days I could be competing on you know quite a few horses in the same day or I could have students competing as well so I think that uh, you know I I try to not have like a real prescription for myself in terms of like what it takes to kind of get me in the zone there because it's going to be different a lot of times mm -hmm. there are you know sometimes you're going to have a course walk that uh, you're going to be really rushed even for a big class of yours and you have to get on and kind of get ready to go. Um, and it, you know, for me, you know, even the night before, I like to really just think through my plan for the day and, you know, little things, you know, if for each horse, there's certain things I want to remember in the warm up area or a certain order of how I want the day to go. I try to really make a plan for it ahead of time so that if you know, the unexpected happens, you know, the horse throws a shoe or, you know, all of a sudden a ring is running quite behind and you're late to the other ring there, that you're not just trying to make up plans on the fly, not just course walk plans, but like, you know, what the actual day needs to look like there. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, for big classes, I like to walk the course at least two times. Um, and I like, you know, it's actually something I've been doing a little more of recently is to walk the first round once walk the jump off and then go back and mm -hmm. walk the first round again because that needs to be your real focus is you know how you're going to get to the jump off not kind of and i think that if that's fresh in your mind that's uh, you know that's a great thing to have do you get nervous when you're competing especially in the bigger classes i wouldn't say nervous i mean you want to do well um i think uh I think there's really two kinds of nerves, I think, that there's the, you know, there's the self-preservation kind of nerves that you, you know, which I think, you know, people try to avoid talking about that, you know, you're worried about staying safe out there. Um, you know, I think, you know, in an ideal world, you want to have all of those thoughts blocked out from your mind as best you can. Um, and, you know, but sometimes, you know, I, that's not the, that's not realistic for all riders to have that blocked out. But mm -hmm. I think that's something I recommend, you know, that you can, if you really are worried about that, you know, talk to your coach about that, you know, in the moment and not be so shy because, you know, if you can at least have a conversation about sometimes that helps kind of alleviate that, uh, allevi alleviate those feelings at least temporarily while you're mm -hmm. competing. Um, the second type of nerves, you know, I think is really about your performance. You know, it's, there's, it's one thing to have nerves about, you know, if you don't want to get hurt in the ring or, fall off and you know that's realistic there um the other kind of nerves are about you know wanting to put in the best performance that you can um so i think that we all have a you know a heightened sense to ourselves that way but i think that you know you you ride your best when you're thinking about the process about you know going in there and just riding correctly and you know whatever the result is you know the result is and you know more times than not if you think about the process that way you're gonna end up at a, you know, at a clear round or at a better result than if you go in there and only focus on results. Because mm -hmm. I think sometimes that you lose the technique then. And um, what do you think makes you a strong competitor? Like what qualities? Um, I think you know, I'm detail oriented, um, and I think that, you know, I, I think talent is a little bit overrated. I mean, I think that, you know any athlete has, a, you know, talent can be, you know, how fast you could run or how high you could jump that's in there. But I think in this here is, um, you know, you need to have a strong work ethic and you need to, you know, you need to have a good system um, in training with your horses. And that, you know, that system is, you know, part, part of your whole team. Um, so I think, you know, what makes me successful is not just me, but it's the whole team behind me. It's, you know, Mario and Sarah and Alex and Eric, the, you know, the people that really make this happen for us. Um, but, you know, in the ring, um, I think, one, you know, I, I think I do a good job of making a good plan and, you know, trying to determine what the best way is to, you know, jump a course clear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, from you know planning standpoint, you know that really um, that helps me to you know go in there and let, like we you know talk about there. You you make a plan, and then instead of focusing on just the results of you know knocking a fence down or not, you're just thinking about executing your plan and going through the process of that the best way you can. 
Um, could you talk about some of the horses in your barn, some of your top mm -hmm. horses, some of the ones you're excited about and what they're like? Yeah, so I'd say my two biggest jumping horses that, you know, I guess we'd probably see on most live streams there are Brindis Bogey Bow and Primo Troy. And Brindis is turning 14 this year. Kind of been a unique story for us. We actually, um, he came into our lives as a nine-year-old uh, in the middle of the year and hadn't really jumped uh, any thing more than like a meter 35 and by the next summer uh, he had uh, a, a really amazing run of uh, four and five star Grand Prix results and he was actually sold um, at the end of his 10 year old year and um, through a unique set of circumstances uh, we actually bought him back uh, when he was 12 and you know he's you know he's been just an amazing competitor for me. The horse the horse means the world to me because he's he's got so much heart. Uh, you know he really gets the sport. Uh, he's you know he's great and you know, under the lights to a big grass field in Spruce Meadows. You know he kind of does all of that really well. Um, you know he's got quite a bit of character to him, uh, but he's like at the same time he's you know he, it's just his intelligence level is incredible. Um, and then. Primo Troy is a, you know, on the younger side for a Grand Prix horse. Uh, he was second at the World Cup qualifier in Washington, at the Washington Interna International Horse Show last year, uh, and amongst the, uh, you know, a bunch of other top results there. And uh, you know, we certainly, you know, I think he's um, he's for sure probably the scopiest horse I've ever ridden, and quite careful, at the, you know, very careful at the same time. Um, and I think he and Brenda's together, you know, I'm really, um, you know, very thankful to the Atasca group who owns the horses for me and, um, you know, that they've entrusted me with the ride on them. And I'm, you know, looking forward to big things with them this year. And then behind them, we have a couple of uh, really nice younger horses on their way up. Gablitz uh, P has just started to jump at the meter 50 level. Um, he is uh, owned by a great lady who's been great support to me uh, and Camilla and, you know, I think what's really neat about that is that she actually picked him out as a five-year-old on her own, oh, and wow. she had a good eye. He's a neat horse. And then um, behind him, we have uh, the two horses I'm really excited about coming up are Chanel and uh, Idol H and H. Uh, Chanel's eight this year, and Idol seven. So I guess you know from the outside, you know, if you know, unless you're in our barn day to day or at the same shows we're at, you might not see them. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of in the it's in the limelight for another year or two, but uh, I'm hoping that you'll see plenty of them in the future. And you welcomed a new addition into your family, your, yes. your little daughter. How, can you talk about how you kind of juggle your riding career with fatherhood and what, what's that been like for you? It's for sure different. You know, I, I'd, I'd say uh, it's better is the only way I'd, you know, mm -hmm. I'd say it there. You know, it's, um, she's been such a blessing to us and, you know, it brings a lot of joy to what we, uh, you know, to our lives every day. Um, even at nine months old, like all she wants to do is be around the horses. So she actually, we went, uh, my student Hannah Lupica showed this last weekend and, we, you know, she got to come to the ring and even, you know, from the fall to now, I mean, she's watching every round, you know, she'll stand with me and watch the rounds and, uh, you know, she's so into it and the horses come over to her and she just melts and laughs and giggles and can't get enough of them. So. I don't know if we, I, I'm not going to push the horses on yeah. I don't know if I want her to ride, but, uh, it, you know, she can do what she wants to do, but that's been, uh, yeah, it's been fun. That's how it always starts. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I think we're in trouble that yeah. way. <laughs> What's something about you that people might not know? I mean, I guess, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know how many people really know, I guess, now where I am, you know, my roots back to Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that... Uh, you know, that's really the bedrock of who I am and, you know, I, you'll see, I guess, in the pictures that it will come out in the article here, we've got the Vikings jump mm -hmm. back there, but more beyond that, you know, just, you know, that was, you know, really what um, brought me up in the, you know, I, you know I, where I grew up, my roots there, but also, I guess, in the sport there as well is that, you know, that, that the wonderful community of the MHJA that I grew up in, um, I think that, you know, that could, you know, you see all the glitz and glam of Wellington or, you know, Spruce Meadows, these great shows there. But, you know, where I think passion really starts in the horses is not, you know, just when you're at the, at the Saturday Night Lights there. It's, you know, when you're in a, you know, community of 
or in a barn of people of all ages that are, you know, out there for the enjoyment of horses and the relationship to them. And, you know, in Minnesota, like, there are some days where it was really cold doing it you know, out there, you know, kind of, you know, big jackets, but everybody would go out there, get their horses ready and, you know, just be, you know, it was a enjoyable thing for us to do together. Um, and I think that, you know, so everybody sees you in the Grand Prix ring there, but like, where did the love of horses start, mm -hmm. the, you know, your commitment to horsemanship and your understanding of them start. I think that that, you know, I think that, um, you know, and that's probably true for somebody all around the country there. But, you know, for me, the bedrock of who I am really comes from back there. And what do you think makes a good horseman? Uh, I mean, you need to be compassionate for sure. Um, you need to be compassionate towards the horses and you need to, you know, you need to realize that they're not, um, you know, these aren't dirt bikes. They're not, they, you know, they're, they're partners of yours. They have emotions. They need to, um, and you know, you need to meet them halfway sometimes. I think that you need to take a step back a lot of the time and say, you know, okay, A, is this safe what we're putting our horses through? Um, and, you know, but also remember the fact that what we're asking them to do is a bit unnatural. And so if you have some days that yeah, I think, A, you need to meet them in the middle with it a little bit, but also be able to say, all right, we need to, um, you know, we need to approach this in a different way. We need to, you know, that you you can't let your frustration get ahead of you with the horse. Um, you know, I think horsemanship in the barn is, you know, I, I, you could say horsemanship from so many levels there, but in the end, you know, I, I think... I think this is the unfortunate side of this is that a lot of people view horses as expendable to get results and um, in the end I'd much rather have a healthy you know I, I want to win but having a healthy and happy horse um, is more important to me than you know kind of doing whatever it takes just to get a blue ribbon there and I think that in the end, the end of the day the, you might, you know, maybe you miss out on one or two classes that way, but over the course of your career, you're going to win a lot more um, by, you know, trying to, you know, by looking at them as true partners that way. And at the end, you know, I would, I would be absolutely gutted if I felt like I disregarded the well-being of a horse just for the sake of a result. And I think that in the end, you need to, in order to really be a true horseman, you need to have you know, you can't just say that. It needs to be like something that's a part of you there. Uh, so what's next for you? A new thing for us we're really excited about is that after Wellington this year, we're establishing a base for ourselves on the north side of Chicago. Great. And uh, we're really excited about it. And I, you know, our, our operation, what we do with the horses is not going to change. Uh, you know, we're still looking to do the you know, the high level shows around North America and, you know, I'll hopefully be able to travel a little bit to and from Europe from there as well. Um, but I think, you know, we're really looking forward to creating a base there. And, you know, I, I think, you know, for us, you know, even talk about, you know, being from Minnesota, being mm -hmm. back in the Midwest, yeah, um, I think it's a yeah, new chapter ahead. Great. Well, thanks so much for chatting with me today, Andrew. Yeah. yeah thanks for having me. Great. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Join us again in two weeks. Upcoming conversations are with the legendary show jumper Eric Neve, rising star Brian Mogri, and hunter and jumper rider Hannah Esop. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. While you're there, please rate and review the show. I'm Jocelyn Pierce, and you've been listening to the Practical Horseman Podcast.